We put our research team to work. This was the ultimate project. We wanted them to pour over every play from every game, doing a whole lot of math in the process they've assembled for you, the top 10 game-changing plays from the 2012 NFL season. And here we go. Jags trailing the Vikings by five under 30 seconds to play. 16% chance of winning until Galbert find shorts on the right side for a great catch touchdown increases the Jags chances of winning to 85 or 87 percent but remarkably they lost wow they lost that game number two Colts trailing the Lions by five four seconds to go fourth and ten it's a seven percent chance at victory but Andrew Luck finds Donnie Avery and you know the deal the game is over so they have a hundred percent chance of winning as Wilson scrambles to keep it alive the game's final play is a Wilson lob to the end zone, which is fought for by Tate with Jennings simultaneous. Who has it? Who they give it to? Touchdown! The Seahawks have won! The controversial TD, a game changer on so many levels this year, <laughs> increased the Seahawks' chances of winning that game from 3% to 100%. Saturday, Syracuse Villanova game, 13 and a half seconds to go. Cues up by three. Digger screaming at the television. Foul it, foul it, foul it. Syracuse opts not to, and with 9.2 to go, still a lot on the clock. Bell misses the three-pointer. Terrific play by Mufiru, kicking it out to Ryan Archidiacono. Archidiacono hits the three that ties the game. Villanova went on to win in overtime. Oklahoma and Baylor, similar situation. Baylor down three. Will Oklahoma, Lon Kruger, choose to foul. Pierre Jackson's going to miss. And again, almost from where Archie Diacono was, Brady Heslip, one of the best three-point shooters around, was able to take one and, oh, Scott Drew right on his back in frustration there. Terrific looks for both of those guys at the end of the game. So the question becomes, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Up three late in the game. What's the proper strategy, foul or not to foul? Well, I think the proper strategy is to foul, but it, it, the question is when. Do you foul under seven seconds, under five seconds? I like under five seconds, but just because that you think that's the best strategy for you and your team if you practice it and you do it the right way doesn't mean that a, a coach relying on his defense in that situation is necessarily bad strategy. And, and that's really the, the, the rub here. The numbers don't indicate what's some say it does that they say fouling is a 17 percent you're more likely to win by 17 percent in that situation our guys that do our, our analytics uh, at, at ESPN Dean Oliver Alok Patani they tell us that those numbers aren't what people say they are the Harvard study uh, says it I think it depends on what you believe in and how you're able to execute it and more importantly than anything when do you foul five seconds seven seconds because in that Syracuse Villanova game you wouldn't have wanted to foul at nine seconds that would have been way too early Welcome to Numbers Never Lie. Michael Smith here from Numbers Never Lie, here to tell you that Yankees captain Derek Jeter is sailing into troubled waters. Maybe GM Brian Cashman ought to Google wins above replacement, or war for short. War tells us the number of wins a player added to his team above what they could have gotten from a player they plucked from AAA. In 2011, Derek Jeter's war was 0 0.7. In other words, he provided less than one win above what a readily available AAA player would have. Brooke Lopez, Nets 24 and 11 with him, 2 and 5 without him. Yep. He's the fourth leading player in player efficiency rating LeBron, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, and Brooke Lopez. Samsung Next Level win shares. That is a statistic that quantifies a player's overall impact on his team's winning, taking into account box score stats in the context of offensive and defensive performance. Surprisingly, heading into tonight's big game, LeBron James trails Kevin Durant slightly in that stat this season. LeBron has led the NBA in win shares in each of the past four seasons. Cristiano Ronaldo was all over the place. He had 14 touches on the right third of the field, as you can see on the right, compared to a total of four touches on the right third in Portugal's first three games. Es cierto que para el Real Madrid significa muchísimo este partido porque la Liga ya se le ha escapado, porque le queda también la Copa, pero nada es seguro en ese torneo. Según el Soccer Power Index, 
El partido casi que lo tiene ganado el Real Madrid uh, con cerca de un 69% de probabilidades de ganárselo no al Manchester United este miércoles. We talked about the IBM Insight Center and the first serves. Is there a place where Azarenka getting more first serves in would lead to her likely winning the set? The target was 59%. She did it 91% of the time in the opening set. When you talk about BPI, that's something we're starting to hear a lot more of. What exactly makes that so important? You know, it goes deeper and it goes wider with the data. I think it's a better predictor of how teams are going to perform in the NCAA tournament. ESPN has done a tremendous job of breaking down all the numbers in a pretty simple and easy to understand way. And bottom line is you got a handsaw or you got a chainsaw. The RPI is more like the handsaw. The BPI is more like a chainsaw. It cuts deep and fast. I love it. You're talking about bubble teams right here. We've got the Atlantic 10 BPI rankings, which is the bar basketball power index that ESPN has created. You see the top four teams right there, VCU, St. Louis, Butler, LaSalle, are all projected in right now by Joe Lenardi. Look at Dayton's BPI score, however. Ranked very high in terms of the numbers and the close losses, Mike, have really put them at a high number. Temple, Charlotte, Xavier on the outside looking in. All right, here's a little look at the rankings comparison of this BPI versus RPI. Amazingly, their RPI is 123. The BPI is 54. It's half that. Yeah, the BPI takes into consideration close losses, and they weigh it differently than the RPI does. So their BPI date is going to look a lot better. There have been two teams that have been the most consistent in the in the basketball power index as far as a variance against other teams. One of them's Grambling because they've lost every game. The <laughs> other's Indiana. And I, I think Indiana's the best half court defensive team. All right, and number one, the biggest play in the last 10 Super Bowls, Eli to Plexico in Super Bowl 42. Less than a minute ago, the Giants need a TD to beat the Pats, and Eli hits. Burris in the end zone, increasing the Giants' odds to win the game by 47%. Hugh, did you think the Giants had a chance to beat the undefeated? I didn't Patrick? think they had a chance, but I know that's not the number one play. The, the, they had one that was bigger to hit, the ball on the head. I, what are you talking about? Who would you rather have, Tom Brady or Peyton Manning? You say Tom Brady, you yes. say Peyton Manning. I say Tom Brady, even though I just saw that it's Manning right here. Both quarterbacks have a nearly identical total QBR this season, but when you adjust QBR to take defenses <laughs> faced into consideration, Manning's QBR is 8.7 points better. Than QBR is the most important stat in pro football. Brady's is number two. Rodgers is number five. Colin Kaepernick yeah. is still being underrated yeah. because even though you can you can poke holes in him and say he's he's so raw and such, right. even though it's his second year, but he is a rookie starting quarterback that he will be the difference for a Green Bay win. I disagree. I trust him. I especially trust him at home. I trust him because he wound up with the third best QBR in football at 76.8. It's three-tenths of a point behind Tom Brady's QBR. And again, I trust QBR. It does tell all about a quarterback. The greatest quarterback stat out there, the one that is QBR. most QBR. QBR. All right, good Thank stuff. A um, couple of things. Uh, obviously, you guys all know that the E and ESPN stands for entertainment, but for the purpose of this conversation, I, I think it also stands for education. And uh, as you can see by that video, one of the things we are committed to is also educating our viewer, our reader, our fans. So one of the things that stood out, uh, and I know as the host of Numbers Never Lie, it's a big part of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, is in order to uh, educate viewers and fans and to give you this next level information, our on-air talent and producers have to embrace it. And not just embrace it, but also understand it. So Dean, starting with you as, as the Dean, I'm sure you've heard that a million times, but yeah. <laughs> starting with you, give, me, give us an idea what the process is of explaining to on-air talent, producers, educating them so that they can incorporate it uh, into their shows and do it properly so that the fans and viewers can understand it and appreciate it. I think a lot of times you start with the stories that they already know how to tell. I think, for instance, we talked a little bit about BPI in there, and BPI is a power rating, and power ratings have been out there before. RPI exists. We can, that conversation already is there. So if you can take that conversation and introduce them to why you can make it a smarter conversation, a deeper conversation, that always helps because they already know how to t 
to say some of those things. And I think a lot of times when we're listening to you guys on the air, or we're, or we're listening to analysts, we'll hear something they say, and if we see a good way to augment their point, to get deeper, to be more specific with the numbers, that's a good way to present it to them. If you're starting with something that they won't buy, it doesn't work as well. Well, I mean, you see Skip going hard for, for total QBR. Right. I embrace analytics. Jay Billis, you know, he happens to be a lawyer, so he knows how to explain <laughs> things anyway. Jay Billis clearly was, you know, buying into some of the advanced analytics in terms of following up three and that sort of thing. How, how much do you, you see that our on-air talent uh, is receptive, Dean, to actually, you know, hearing what you guys have to say, especially when it's a former player or a former coach? I think it's, it's, it's highly variable. Uh, I think I like, I like there's a Hugh Douglas clip in there. There's a couple of them, actually. But the, the one with the, the win probability in the Super Bowl, we put that in there um, because he kind of says, yeah, that wasn't even the biggest play. It's, it's OK for him to say that. I think it's actually useful for him to say that. It would be nice if we could have at that time, and it's difficult to do it in any situation, to say, you're saying that was the biggest play, the helmet catch. It was a big play because the win probability, if we could quantify, and we probably can if we took the time, during that play, Eli Manning almost got sacked. So the win probability for them went way down. And then he came out of it miraculously. Then he's thrown a Hail Mary, and you're subjectively looking. There's no way this is going to be complete. And then he kind of catches it. You're not actually sure whether he catches it. So your own win probability goes up and down. So when, when I hear Hugh saying that, it's not a bad thing. He's authentic. He's talking about what he knows. I think what, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build up is having a little bit of that ability to play off them, to add a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. Hugh can be who Hugh is. He's mm -hmm. great. Uh, we just want to add a little bit more. I love you. Uh, you're my go-to guy. Obviously, <laughs> Jay Billis is. You know, <laughs> yeah. Jay gave you the shout-out, which was cool. Uh, you know, I come down to you, you know, all the time, yeah. ask you questions. Hey, you know, am I right about this? What do you think about this? How do I incorporate analytics? Uh, in my presentation, so you're an awesome resource. How much uh, do talent and producers uh, embrace what you bring to the table and try to incorporate the information that you have uh, into their programming, or is it still a bit of a struggle to get people to, to, to buy what you're selling? It's definitely uh, a struggle. Uh, some things are less of a struggle than others. There's kind of this inherent you know, quarterback rating, like, oh, I can watch the quarterback and I can tell if he's good or not or how good he is and I can rank him and or they trust someone, you know, one of our former coaches who watches quarterbacks. So they kind of that's kind of the default. So if we have a rating system and they're like, well, it doesn't take into account this, it take into account that. So once you say, oh no, it takes into account that, you know, six yards on third and five is, is better than six yards on third and eight, and then and you start to listen and then you kinda get them in and then you start telling them, okay, what kind of stories can I tell with this sort of information? So I think an easier sell it was something like the win probability because you can get those top 10 plays. We do top 10s all the time on SportsCenter. Here's a different way to do it that's objective. You don't even have to have someone to rank them. We have, you know, we have it in our database. We can pull it out. Here are the top 10 plays. You know, we get, have great video people, obviously. You put video to that place. Our anchors do a good job. You know, like, oh, this was a really fun play. They, and it turns into like a really interesting segment for the viewers. So that stuff is sort of easier, the quarterback ratings, the basketball power index, because there's biases already coming in. That's where you kind of have to overcome it. Mike, do you have thoughts? Yeah, this has just revolutionized the way that I can do my job. I basically, I cover the NFC West for the, the website. And you know, I can remember not that long ago that um, you know, as a reporter, you might be intrigued by you know, somebody's home road splits or, uh, you know, turf grass. I, I heard a couple of references to that from some of the personnel guys from teams this week. Just throwing it out there as gra like a grass turf split on a, on a player. And now you're like, that's, that's so five years ago. And now uh, what happens is we can dial up and see that, you know, Russell Wilson holds the ball for 3.64 seconds before releasing the pass. And you say, okay, well, who cares about that? Well, when somebody asks me to evaluate the wide receivers for the Seahawks, I can take account into my mind that they may have a significant uh, greater amount of time to get open. You know, it, it may not be a huge factor, but it's, that's the type of stuff um, that you can know. And so um, 
49ers Packers playoff game, another example, okay? Colin Kaepernick has 181 yards rushing, and typically in the past, you know, I would do some game charting, but I would probably have to go back the next day and break those down to see, you know, how many of those were on the option runs, that type of stuff, and instead, I go down to the locker room, do my regular interviews, I come back up, and there's an email um, from, from our stats and information team that says, okay, he had 181 yards rushing, 178 were before contact, and 99 of them were on option runs. Well, now I'm dropping that into a column that's going to be written on deadline and posted a couple hours after the game. That's really valuable information for someone who's reading that. And from our standpoint as writers, I mean, it's like, there, it's like uh, value added to your IQ. I mean, you suddenly have a totally more intelligent approach to the game um, without making any effort to win. Tom, your thoughts on uh, incorporating analytics into, into print and making it entertaining? Well, I have it easy because I can actually explain in a thousand word column mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. For you, I feel bad for you guys. You have to give Hugh Douglas, like, all right, so <laughs> in 20 seconds, you have to explain yeah. QBR. Uh, that's tough, but uh, I remember so like three years ago, I, I moved down to Miami to cover the heat um, using an analytical focus. And I didn't know how that was going to go, but they gave me fodder every single game. And I remember in the playoffs the first year, um, they lost a close game. So they lost by like one point. And the conventional wisdom said, oh, they can't win in the clutch. Mm -hmm. They're 6-15 and 15 in games uh, when the score is let within five points. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't really buy that. I don't really, they've, they've taken games that were close and they've pushed it out of the five point margin. And yet we don't characterize that as a close game. Mm -hmm. So I looked, at, looked into the play by play and I found out that actually when the game gets into close clutch time, within five points, last five minutes of the game, they were actually a winning team. They were 24 and 21. And the reason was because they would take, you know, be a two point game with less than a minute left, and LeBron James would just go Nova and hit like four shots, they'd win by 10. Mm -hmm. And that was a close game. And uh, like last night, Memphis was down by one point, Marc Gasol hits a shot with 42 seconds left, they win by seven, uh, the Heat win by seven, and that's not considered a close game. Mm -hmm. So while everyone was talking about the Heat are not clutch, and LeBron James is terrible, and Dwayne Wade is awful, and they're deferring, and um, we just kind of flipped the script and showed people that, um, the way that we had been talking about the game was not accurate. And they were actually okay in the clutch. They weren't great. But the whole uh, narrative that they just crumbled in the crunch time just didn't make any sense to me. And I was able to explain that. And that was one of the things that I look back on that, um, that really resonated with not just me, but for, for the readers mm -hmm. as well. That, that word clutch is a, uh, is a buzzword <laughs> yes. uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, some people define clutch as a walk-off shot. You know, you and I have talked about hero ball. Yeah. You know, a oh, lot. Yeah. You know that that uh, unfortunate uh, act of, you know, dribbling down the, the last few seconds to take a game-winning shot to get on the Sports Center top ten. But when you bring up clutch and what it really is versus what the common perception of it is, it brings me to the next point, which is how much do you guys and uh, and I'll go back to you, Dean, to start this one. How much do you guys see your role as as almost the charge with dispelling myths? one at a time, <laughs> you know, whether it's clutch or, or you got to run to set up the pass, as, as, as Mike Sando has written about. Yeah, How much we, is dispelling myths? We, uh, I feel like a lot of the times we're, jo we're like sports yep. mythbusters, and uh, a lot of the time I'm looking at the conventional wisdom and checking it, and we're showing our work. So instead of just saying that Kobe Bryant's the best clutch player in the NBA, bar none, he's a cold-blooded assassin, drop the mic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Alok has done yeah. all that work. Exactly. <laughs> he, he takes oh, wait, shot. Exactly. Say, this is this is this is exactly. Alok's baby right here. And, <laughs> he's about to drop the mic on Kobe. And, uh, <laughs> and it's like it's like no, like he's missed tons of shots, but that doesn't make Sports Center because right. that's that's not, when he misses a shot, we go, oh, he was supposed to miss that shot because it was a backbreaking, you know, terrible shot. But we don't get to watch those all those clips of him missing. I mean, Alok, you actually, I don't know how you did this. You're awesome, but <laughs> did you look at? All of Michael Jordan's clutch shots, or yeah, yeah. and you didn't even have the data. The data you had yeah. to go into the newspapers. Yeah, you had to go through newspapers. Yeah. So, it, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was motivated by the Kobe Bryant because we have the data on Kobe Bryant, so we can go back years and we can just see, and we can look at the examples, and, and it doesn't take very long. Michael Jordan, the the play-by-play -play data doesn't go back that far, so 
had to go in. And you, you assume if there's a very close game, they're going to narrate the last few seconds of the game, which they do. Th this explains, OK, w there was a kind of a, a myth or you know, there was some data that made it look this way. But during the football season, there was a lot of talk about has Tom Brady lost his clutchness in the last couple minutes of the games? Because you know, over the last few years, you know, he just hasn't had his, his numbers haven't been as good late in the games. And so I was going to be discussing this on, our, uh, uh, on, a, on a podcast. And so I emailed the stats and info team and analytics team and, and we said, hey, what do, you know, what do we got on this? Now, I guess I, this makes sense now. I did not know that this was your sort in your wheelhouse. <laughs> That's so, why Jeff gave it to me. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I'm serious. Like within an hour, hour and a half, I get like a thousand word treatise back, an email with charts, bolded items, really explaining how that's really a bunch of nonsense, that, that it just would happen, that, that basically clutch play can't be, it, there, there's, it's not predictable. I mean, if, you, if, you're gonna, if you're a good player, you'll play good regardless of when the, it says in the game. And you'll have stretches late in games where it doesn't go well, and others. So this, that, is, this is kind of a standard thing that analytics has been for, is to kind of show that, you know, clutch is not reproducible. Not easy to. Bill James did a lot of this stuff. What's What's interesting to me is when we can actually, we look to bust them at actually the fouling up three situation. We did a lot of our work a year ago, a year before the piece was ever done, and it comes out somewhat inconclusive. Whether you foul or not is is not an easy call. There's no, it, we couldn't bust a myth, so we weren't necessarily ready to put it out there. And fortunately, Jay Billis and I, you noticed that that they were going to do a segment on it because they had to. And so we could pull up our old work. And it takes the right people a lot of times delivering that message, which is kind of a neutral one, but he did it well. He told the story. He, you talk about education. That's what it was a really good segment for doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And myth busting is one thing. It does educate. It can create a little bit of a divide between the traditional people and others. But if you get to a conclusion that is a little bit iffy, it allows people to say, oh, yeah, there is a little bit of hedge. You can allow people to make their own decisions based upon specific things that are not in the analysis. And there's, it's nice to see that. There's, a, there's definitely, though, that, that balance between education and entertainment. And mm -hmm. you know, we, we, obviously, as the you know, least smart person on this panel, well, you know, but I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate and embrace analytics. Uh, our audience, thank you guys for coming out, clearly appreciates and embraces analytics and what you guys do. We work together behind the scenes, but ultimately we have to serve the viewer, get clicks, uh, get ratings. And it's one of the things that our numbers never lie over the evolution of the show we've tried to balance is you know, heavy analytics, you know, uh, educating the viewer, but still being entertaining so that people yeah. will want to watch. So I wonder, Stro, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, I, you know how, how I feel about your writing, and you, know, you had a, a great column recently about uh, LeBron being an elite shooter this year when you crunched his numbers through synergy and so on. Like, what's the balance and what kind of reception do you get from readers uh, when you start to go heavy in the analytics and, you know, do, do they enjoy that? Do they embrace it? Do they want more? They're like, hey, miss me with all these numbers. Uh, I, what I like to do is usually when I have some really interesting data, I don't knock you over the head with it right off the bat. What I try to do is start off with a piece of imagery so you can see what's happening on the court. So it's not something abstract. So if I'm talking about LeBron's jumper, maybe I'll start off saying, like, you know, Paul George was in his face late in the fourth quarter, and he went, drove to the corner, and he rose up and drained the three. And fans can, can retrieve that in their head. Mm -hmm. And they're like, OK, yeah, I remember LeBron hitting a shot. And then I go into the data, and then they're like, oh, yeah, he is hitting a lot of uh, jumpers. And you compare him to Kevin Durant, Kobe Bryant. And then it starts becoming real. What I find is when you throw people numbers and you just stick them against the wall, people don't really, you know, uh, they're not receptive to that. And so what you want to do is relate it back to the court mm -hmm. and um, so that they can actually see that this is something that's, like a lot of people think that stats are just made up out of thin air. But really they're just an accounting of what's on, going on in the court. Right. And so I've had people, I mean, when I started writing in Miami, I had other writers who had been on that that beat, that territory for years, and they were very um, territorial. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, you're writing about stats, this is horrible, you're killing the game, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, well then, a few weeks later, they're using the same stats that I was using. Mm -hmm. um, because they realize that this is a totally um, new way of looking at the game and sometimes more accurate. So 
I had a lot of resistance at first, but when you kind of relate it back to the court mm -hmm. and what's happening on what they're watching, I think people really respond. Uh, just like the Kobe Bryant stuff. If we had video of Kobe Bryant missing a ton of shots, I think people would be more receptive to it. But, but on the flip, but you got a lot of people that say, uh, and Mike, especially in football, I know what I see. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, I, I keep your numbers, I, I, I watch the game, you know, you, you're just twisting them, this, that, and the other. How much, how much are your viewers, or excuse me, your readers, uh, hungering for more of, of that uh, analytics, or they're saying, hey, you know what, you're going too heavy on this, or? Well, you know, the, it's a little, it was a challenge for some with total QBR, but the, the most resistance was from people who just didn't like the idea that ESPN is trying to promote this. Oh, yeah, I get that and, a lot. And, and so whenever you would reduce it to a debate over or a discussion over the merits, you wouldn't get anything. You know, maybe, you know, maybe somebody who's into advanced stats would question, quibble with, uh, you know, the distribution of credit in, in a certain area. But no, but no one who is complaining and saying that, oh, come on, ESPN had anything other than they were just annoyed that, that ESPN was, was promoting it. When you actually get to the, the merits of it, um, people are defi will definitely embrace it. And I try to, I try to interject it into uh, or use it with things that are very topical. So, you know, I think we would all um, agree that through the first half of the season that Andrew Luck and Robert Griffin III were the leading candidates for Rookie of the Year. And as the season went along, you know, Russell Wilson was doing uh, better and better, but I think uh, there was a lot of stuff built into people's heads, especially, uh, you know, Se Seattle's kind of known as Southern Alaska in the NFL. People don't see, you know, don't see the games. And so uh, I was able at one point, just kind of stumbled into this. I didn't know what the results would be, but I noticed that Luck and Wilson had eight common opponents, which in the NFL, you like that. I mean, we would love to have 80 common opponents, but, you know, with 16 games, we'll take eight. So, okay, we dialed up the two against eight common opponents, and um, Russell Wilson had 17 touchdown passes and one interception against those eight teams, and Andrew Luck was 14 and 13. Well, it doesn't mean that Wilson should be the rookie of the year. I mean, you know, 20 more pass attempts per game for Andrew Luck, it's a, it's a different challenge for him, but it added something to the conversation and stirred a lot of uh, discussion, and I think we walked away having, uh, you know, and QBR was a component of that too, having used analytics to get to the bottom of something. Another, another favorite one of mine is the idea of, oh, he's going against eight-man fronts. Well, that doesn't really matter if you have nine blockers, right? Hmm. I mean, that's one of those things that sounds good and was probably a great stat five years ago, but um, if you're playing in an offense that uses two backs and two tight ends all the time, um, you would love to see eight-man fronts. And so, like, you heard that a lot with Adrian Peterson. He's mm -hmm. going against a lot of eight-man fronts. Yes, but if you looked at the number of times that uh, the defenders in the box outnumbered the available blockers, it was a re not a huge staggering percentage. Well, that's what's important to me. That's, that's the tool we should be using. And so. Those are a couple of examples um, of some of the stuff I think that we have that can advance the conversation. And, and Mike, is, Mike is doing a really good job exposing a lot of the stuff that we don't necessarily have time. We build, we built QBR. We're building a college version of QBR. We, we're building. Breaking uh, news. Yes. We're building a lot of these things, and it's, <laughs> it's hard to expose every aspect of it. We're counting on these guys to, to take some of this while we move on to build the next thing a lot of times. And, there's a lot of splits. I mean, we're talking about splits on QBR. We're talking about fundamentally, though, what is winning a game? And we're trying to build a lot of the analytical tools for what really wins a game, because that is the basic sports story, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what wins. And so we're trying to put those components in, in there and allow them to come out so that you can break them down. You can really tell that story better. One of the, one of the tough things for people about uh, QBR and, and it, is that uh, quarterbacks get blamed for a portion of the sacks. That's been a huge thing. And yet I can remember um, when quarterback hits first became sort of a pseudo stat in the box score and it was not reliable at all because you'd have someone in one press box counting every time that's a quarterback mm -hmm. hit. But, but I was paying attention to this and I remember interviewing Mike Sherman when he got the job at uh, Houston, he was down there to be the coordinator, and, and Matt Schaub had taken like a thousand, or not Matt Schaub, uh, David Carr had oh, taken like a thousand sacks, you know, and so when Schaub came in, it had gone way down, and I remember asking him um, about that, and what did you do with your line and this type of stuff, and he's like, 
the sacks are on the quarterback. What are you talking about? I mean, sure, if you had a horrible line, but the, the quarterback determines whether you're going to get out of that. So for somebody like Aaron Rodgers, that's a great trade-off because he's going to – he'll take some, a lot of sacks among the most in the league, but he's going to make a ton of plays too. Mm -hmm. For somebody like Alex Smith, those sacks could explain why in 2011 his QBR was well below average even though he had a passer rating that said – in, that he was a Pro Bowl caliber player. Very, very helpful to see that and see how those types of things yeah. um, impact the way we view a player. Somebody like Jay Cutler, I mean, his QBR over a five year period is average. Right. Well, doesn't mean it's 100% right, but to me, um, I want to know that information because, okay, what, what should we be looking at? Because he, he, I think most people would say he deserves a lot of money. You, you touched on something earlier, and I, and I told you I get that a lot as well. I, anytime we bring up QBR, people roll their eyes. You know, like we, sure. we, we embrace it internally. Right, they, they don't roll their eyes <laughs> you, at passer rating. Exactly. And, the, and nobody could explain either one. You know, right. nobody right. could explain how you come up with passer rating or, or how we came up with total QBR, but it's not net yet mainstream. It's dismissed often as a, an ESPN thing that we're pushing and that we're, we, I mean, me, Tom, Mike, are told to push onto our you know, viewers or Absolutely. readers. How, how, are, how are we going about trying to further establish the credibility of this all-encompassing statistic, Dean? Well, part of it is, is just having the name out there. And pe when people hear it, and eventually you're gonna hear a point that is, it makes your point for you. And that's, sort of, that's where Skip Bayless is up there. Yes, he's using a lot of his, uh, the, using QBR to make some of these points. But uh, pushing it out there is just to get it part of the, the language, of a batting average, mm -hmm. on-base percentage, uh, all of the baseball things. Just takes They're time. now part of that language. And that's, that's what you're trying to build up is a language of, of familiarity. The people who've been in the sport for a long time, it may not have been part of their language. And you have to, you have to walk them through it a little bit. Some are earlier adopters and some of them won't ever adopt it. But it's, it's not a bad thing. I think there's also the language that the coaches have. Having been in the NBA for a long time and you listen to play calls, they have a language that is encompassing very complex concepts themselves. And do we bring that to the broadcast? Sometimes. Sometimes Jeff Van Gundy will talk about mm -hmm. uh, a white defense or a five and these kinds of, and he has to explain it then too. Mm -hmm. What's the difference there? If we can explain yeah. QBR. You can explain what whiting is and that sort of thing too. It's, it's a terminology and if you want to know how the game is played, if you want to know what it takes to win, there is a little bit of overhead and 10% or 20% are going to adopt it quickly and others are going to take a little bit of time. I think it's the, the one thing is explaining it to the people who work at ESPN who are former players and coaches, that's similar to what you hear at this conference. People talking about how do I explain it to a decision maker on a team. We also have a different challenge, and the bigger challenge is to explain it to fans. And I think it's different because the coaches are like, well, does it take into account this, 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 this? You know, that's what they go. The fans are just kind of like, oh, my quarterback's number one? This is a great system. You know, like, this is the best system ever. <laughs> or if they're, if, yeah, so they don't like, you know, the 49ers fans probably don't like it because it had Alex Smith lower, but Peyton Manning fans liked it or something like that. So the key is, like, what question are you trying to answer? QBR is it trying to answer who has been the most you know, best, if most efficient quarterback. The, you know, the other, if, other, before QBR, if I want to answer that question, I'm like, oh, well, here's this completion percentage, here's this, and then, like, those are numbers that people understand, but you don't have an idea of how to put all that together. Plus, it doesn't take into account all the stuff that QBR does. So it's, try, it's trying to reach this audience in a, well, by, like, starting with something very complicated, put it out on one scale that everyone kind of can grasp. So it is to serve the fans. That is the goal. You know, we want to take into account what the analysts are taking into account, but the end goal is this is to help you. I, I think something that could be really helpful here would be to, um, I, I think if people could look at, at games the way QBR does, which is uh, that there's a, there are expected points associated with every play for offense or defense. For example, if you have um, the ball at your own one yard line, the defense is more likely to score next. You would rather have that than, uh, You'd rather be on defense. Yeah, yeah, you'd rather be on defense in that situation. So um, if you understand that from a play-to-play -play situation that how many points the offense and defense are expected to score changes and that decisions coaches make or players make directly play into that. Absolutely. And, they're, and see, where I think this will head in the end or next or at some point is that that'll be tied in with win probability and it'll be on the screen. And so you'll see 
uh, during the course of a game. Ooh, look, he's going to go, he's got their punting here. Um, what does it say? Okay, this is a net loss of 14 percentage points in win probability. Going to have some explaining to do after the game. Yep. And, and suddenly now that coach is going to pay attention because so, so many, the criticism is so many decisions are made to insulate yourself from criticism. So, so now you can criticize them on a higher level. So if we bring, <laughs> to me, if you bring expected points into it, um, that, that's kind of where it's at for understanding it. One of the, uh, one of the things we were hoping for uh, from this panel was not for just to be uh, informative to you guys, but for you guys to help us um, be better at educating and entertaining you through analytics. Um, so we got a couple of good questions, I think, if, uh, if you guys are down with kind of incorporating some we questions into the conversation. Yep. This, one, this one caught my eye uh, because it kind of hit home. Uh, remember when numbers, Number li Never Live first started, those of you remember? You know, we had an asterisk uh, after Never. I, I think that's self-explanatory. <laughs> Not everybody quite picked up on that. You know, it was like, well, what's the asterisk for? Well, that's because numbers, it depends on what story you're trying to tell. So this question I thought was pretty apropos. Uh, question is, has it become a selective stat picking error? For every two stats that say one thing, you can find three stats that tell the opposite story. If you dig deep enough, like as we can manipulate stats. So uh, in other words, Tom, do you find that if you're writing a, a, a statistic, uh, excuse me, an article that says LeBron's an elite shooter, with all the homework you've done, you find people kind of coming back at you and saying, well, you're just doing it to kind of create a narrative. I don't believe this. I think you're just trying to suck up to LeBron or what have you, or I got a counter stat for you. <laughs> right. Well, part of the, part of the, I mean, what we're trying to do is just give facts. Mm -hmm. And if you, if I say, <clears throat> when LeBron catches a ball and shoots it, he's better than Steve Novak, Stephen Curry, all these guys. I'm, I don't know what to do with that other than like, this is amazing. Like, right. This is, we look at his 41% three point percentage and a lot of those shots are being contested, but when he, off the dribble, so these are tougher shots. So you might not think he's one of the best three point shooters in the league, but when you distill it down to just your standard catch and shoot, he's superb. And um, when you present those facts, it goes back to what Alex said. You have to remember what, what's the question you're a asking. And so, yes, you can throw like three different stats on the other side, mm -hmm. but you might be changing the question. And so if we're asking ourselves, is LeBron James an elite three-point shooter or, or an elite jump shooter, I can throw out a bunch of different statistics mm -hmm. that show that he is in these settings. But, but there's, there's, there's a translation issue here, too. There's a, you're going from the words into the numbers. I, one of my favorite examples is, is he an important player? <laughs> and because what is it you know, important? Is he is, a difference maker? Yeah, okay. because it, it implies that not only that they're good, presumably, but also that you can do something about it. And that's, that's kind of the question of importance. If LeBron's always here, well, how important is he? Because no, no matter what you do, he's there. But that, that sort of, that's where there's this difficulty in translating from the words into the numbers, and mm -hmm. people can cherry pick. I, I think. Uh, I will also say, too, having been working for a team, mm -hmm. when you work for a team, uh, you, are, you care very much about getting that right because you don't want to draft the wrong player, you don't want to make the wrong trade, mm -hmm. you don't want to sign someone for yeah. too much or too little. Right. In the media, it, you it is. You want to be right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, it's, you want your opinion to be right. Yeah, we, it's, and you want entertainment, like yeah. you say. I mean, there are ways to discuss importance in different ways, or who is good, or then greatness. Yeah. So, and if you bring out all those, that's a lot of our job, is to bring out all of those. Even if, it, there may be a better way to combine it all, but having people discuss it is very useful for us. Yeah. Alok, one of my favorite projects that you, that you worked on, um, is Alok and I don't sit too far from one another, from each other, <laughs> like we're kind of in the same building a few steps away. Uh, the Andrew Luck RG3 yeah. comparison that yep. ended up uh, being picked up, I think, by the New York Times yeah. as well. Um, this is when RG3, and, and he finished with great numbers, rookie of the year, obviously, but he had his, past, his traditional stats, passer rating, yards per attempt, yeah. everything was off the charts yeah. in his favor against Andrew Luck. Yeah. But then, based on the advanced analytics, yeah. Luck was attempting a higher degree of difficulty and was actually the more efficient runner. Yeah. Hard to believe, though, that may be for a lot of people with the naked eye, yeah. but that was something that kind of flip the script a little so, bit, so, you know. 
Yeah, so get back to the, the question on yeah. like cherry picking. I actually hate that. I hate cherry picking stats. <laughs> the reason it has to be done from our perspective is we're, we're constantly with QBR and other stats. We're kind of battling the traditional. If I say Peyton Manning's the best, you know, people are challenging on maybe time, but it's not, not that controversial. At the time when we said, when the QBR had Andrew Luck, you know, a little bit ahead of RG3, that was extremely controversial mm -hmm. um, because of what the basic stats said. So then I have to cherry pick the argument to support Andrew Luck when in reality, like RG3 was a better passer. But what I was showing, or you know, with the help of a lot of people in our group, I shouldn't, it wasn't just me, um, we looked and we said that, look, he was, uh, Andrew Luck is getting, like RG3 is running for more yards. Andrew Luck is getting first downs. Uh, RG3 is fumbling on some of these runs. And it's not necessarily being fumbled away to the other team, but his teammates are covering it. Should he get credit for that? You know, th that sort of stuff. So there I have to cherry pick just to explain the whole, you know, people aren't just going to take QBR at face value. Then you have to say, all right, well, what, is, what are they most uh, disagreeing with? And how can we pick the numbers, the situations, the examples that will convince them otherwise? Big difference between cherry picking and misleading. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, we're not trying to just pick both sides. I'm right. just trying to be like, OK, I think this is what you think. So here's what, how I'll respond to that. And a lot of it is we're just giving a more complete picture. You know, yeah. some people just throw one stat out and then, yeah, but you're also forgetting about this, like the fumbles thing. I was yeah. just thinking like, oh yeah, that's another way to look at it. Yeah, and, and it's all in QBR. So if you trust QBR, I don't have to explain to you. But right. <laughs> a lot of people don't, so I do. <laughs> Dean, speaking of QBR, uh, you, you mentioned, there's another question is what's the next QBR? You kind of teased this a little bit earlier yep. with what's next. You mentioned a college QBR. What are some of the next steps for our, our analytics team uh, <laughs> that you can share? We are working on a college version of, of QBR. In the NFL, of course, it's a much smaller subset of teams. You have 32 teams. We can actually track the games on weekends in, in great detail. On the college side, it's a little more difficult. We do track a lot uh, for some of the more prominent teams. So we're putting that together with a college version of QBR with the intent of not only talking about the college game and who are better quarterbacks, and quarterbacks by this metric as we look at it, have become more important uh, in the college game. But also to look at, potentially, the, the, the draft value of these guys, uh, drafting quarterbacks after we did the NFL QBR special, Ron Jaworski came up to me and said, I can't wait to see a college version because they know how hard it is to draft quarterbacks. And we've seen a lot of that recently. We're also, the other thing that we are working on essentially at the same time is a college football power index to as we, we go out of the BCS era into the playoff uh, situation, we want to have a power index or a way of describing who's good, who has a resume that is deserving of being in that playoffs, but also who's the best team. Uh, in this year, we look at Notre Dame. They had a resume that certainly deserved, deserving of playing in a final game, but everybody knew that they were not as good as Alabama. And we want to be able to do to have a power index that lends to that conversation, that allows people to quantify what they're subjectively thinking. So those are the, the big steps we're heading on. What, do you, what would you guys like to see uh, us, as, in terms of on-air talent, but also in terms of production, do better to, to better visually share this information? I mean, you know, we're very proud, sorry, we're very proud of, uh, of our whiteboard uh, at Numbers Never Lie. That's been a big hit. Um, you know, Sports Center obviously does a, a lot of with where this top ten win, per, win percentage swings, or a lot of different elements that Sports Center uses. Samsung Next Level is another example. Uh, but just from your observations, what can we do better to take the visual aspect to the next level and make it entertaining, but also easily digestible? That's a, that's a major struggle. Hello. Yeah, I mean, we're, a lot of that goes with stuff that's been discussed at this conference, data visualization, and that sort of element. I think a lot of it. Um, you know, when we talk about things like these scrambles or Kobe missing shots, like sometimes we just show the numbers and it is a push and pull with the producers who don't have limited time. But if you want to show like, oh, here are five of the missed shots that you probably forgot, or here are big plays for a guy's QBR that maybe you didn't think were big. So um, I think video is, is key to all, like anytime we try to sell something to TV, um, having worked as a researcher on shows, I try to use that and be like, okay, how would we put the best video to this? And, and obviously the top win probability plays, that just works so perfectly. Other places it doesn't, but you know, we, can, we can supplement that. So I think video is big. Um, data visualization is, is sort of oncoming. Some of those things are a little bit 
you know, it's like a shot chart is simple, but if you want to do something that really tells a story, it, it's not immediate. You kind of have to give that time as well. Mm -hmm. So we're studying what people like the New York Times guys have done mm -hmm. to try to to build that in some complex concepts. They're they're helping us by dealing with other complex concepts. And if we can build things that may work in print, um, that's one thing. And it does. You do get that time to look at it. Doing the stuff for for you guys. I, I think the whiteboard is really effective. And I, we've also talked about animations, things where you can do touch screens to highlight certain aspects of maybe an infographics on there, because what you guys do does have to go pretty fast. So yeah. it's, it's, that's an evolving thing. We can't wait to do it better. I, I, I love heat maps um, or anything that gives me color, makes the numbers come alive. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if, if anyone wants to get into you know, sports analytics or whatever, I would try to learn from other sports. So if you're a really big baseball fan, don't just put the blinders on with baseball. Look at other sports and see how they're covering the sport because some of the best stuff that, um, the most fun that I have is uh, you know, data visualization and I learned from fan graphs with war, uh, cumulative war over the career and the way they visualize it, it really drove home the point that like you know, Alex Rodriguez or whoever it was, um, was a lot better historically than people imagine. Um, and so I did that with, uh, you know, with some of the all-time scoring leaders in the NBA. And I did the same cumulative graph. And it was visually, you could grasp that, you know, some guys, you know, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James are on pace, mm -hmm. um, potentially, if they go into their 50 years old, to beat Kareem. <laughs> and that tells a story. And that's what you want to do is have data visualization come alive, uh, you know, stats or analytics come alive with data visualization. And um, you guys can show video, but online, um, at least for the NBA, we can't show video. Um, and, and that's, well, we can in short clips and it's complicated, but um, some of the stuff I would really like to show video clips, but just rights issue, it's, it makes it tough for some of us in print. I think what also helps is we have 3,000 people here at this conference. If you can tell us, too, things that you would like to see, because we get, we get feedback from a variety of different people, and, and sometimes the feedback you get is they don't like it. And if you like it, that's great for us to hear. Uh, because we have a lot of things we want to do, and if, if we can support it by the fans saying they want it, it's great. You guys ever feel guilty? And this is what I mean by that, because there's a couple of <laughs> What? <laughs> that was some shock value. So, um, you know, because a couple of questions. It's interesting. We, we talked about being myth, buff, myth busters earlier, okay? Do you ever get any feedback from those who feel like analytics takes away from the story of sports? Does Analytics as a myth, buster, myth busters, I'm gonna stop saying that word all together. <laughs> Does it take the magic out of sports? In other words, like, you know, it, it's, we're here to set the record straight, but part of sports is, you know, the myths and, 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 and the, uh, the legends and, and, and the fun part of it. Do you ever get that kind of feedback from people that's like, yo, man, why are you telling me that Kobe's not clutch? Although I wanna believe that Kobe's clutch. <laughs> why are you telling me this, you know? Yeah, I don't. Um no, no, I don't Santa feel Claus. guilty about that, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> um, I think in some cases it can, it can help. I mean, I, it, for, for every, you know, it, it explains, yeah, it doesn't take the fun out of Kobe, maybe, but, like, maybe there's someone who's really good. Or maybe, you know, like, Robert Ory was really good in that situation, and he should be credited more, or, you know, that. And then it's we're adding to the conversation sometimes. Like, you know that the Russell Wilson play, the fail Mary or whatever was big, and we can quantify it. And I think that, that only helps, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, like sometimes it takes away from what people think, but in the end, you kind of, you know, we want our analysts to be right. We want our personal analysis to be right. I think when Mike or Tom write, they want to be saying something that is correct, not just what people want to hear. Right. Well, I, a lot of the stuff that I get when I'm myth busting, um, <laughs> I, I do get some uh, brushback yeah. from people saying like, "Watch the games" or "Count the rings." You know, the the cliche <laughs> stuff with the Z, um, right? Count the rings. Lots of Z's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and the more Z's, the lower the IQ. Um, <laughs> so, but I also get people who say capital letters. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I've been telling my dad this for years, <laughs> and he just won't. Believe me, but now I'll hand him a link if he reads online uh, or a newspaper <laughs> clipping um, 
a link to this article, and then I'll you know follow follow up with that person and like uh, what it, like what was so compelling about that? I will try to keep doing that. Yeah. And so as much as I get people who say um, the negative stuff, the negativity of right. of uh, when we're being more analytical, I also get a lot of people who say I'm so glad that we're having this conversation yeah. because we haven't. You know, the game, the technology, the players are getting better, bigger, faster, and yet our analysis may not be um, in line with that. Yeah. And we might be dragging behind. So while all these guys are getting better, so is our analysis. Like Dean, I mean, there's a, a large segment of our, of our viewers, of our readers, uh, of our consumers, you know, who are, who are much like, I think about Moneyball and, you know, and, and you know, Billy Bean trying to get the old, the old guard scouts to embrace what he was doing. There's a large segment of our viewers that are, that are saying this, like, quit, quit, like, quit bombarding me with numbers. I don't want to go to school. I just got out of school. I want to well, well, watch sports. I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this. How much would your job be easier on Numbers Never Lie if you had an ex or a former athlete who was well-versed in analytics? How much would it be easier? Or how much would you be like, thank you? Uh, well, well, Jalen, thanks for reversing this. This is fun. <laughs> Uh, Jalen, <laughs> Jalen's pretty good on numbers, as is Hugh, and they both understand them. I think part of what we try to do on, on, on our show is, is bring, bring that balance between experience, practical right. experience, and me representing, or the number, answering a debate, representing the analytics and the research. Right. So that's part, we're, we're trying to almost like uh, embrace that, that, that battle, you know what I mean, between, well, here's what I see, here's what I know because I played and I watched the games, Here's what I know because I went and talked to a local, I read Dean, you know, I read, I read Stroll, that sort of thing. So I, I don't think, I wouldn't change that. I mean, we could, we could okay. certainly incorporate more uh, analytics experts. That might be something we do in the future. But be I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we need uh, an athlete who is all in on analytics. You know what I mean? That would kind of take away from what we're trying to create. But that said, there are still people who come at me and say, how dare you, you know, say, this, Jalen played, or Hugh played, or you know, you don't know what you're talking about, take your numbers and go somewhere, you big, you big nerd, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, or do we just, Dean, I'm, I'm saying, do we just forget about those people, or are there ways you're still trying to incorporate numbers and make them more appealing to that segment of the population? Yeah, I, I think we are making them more appealing to the, yeah. that segment of the population. I think there's, they're, as they understand what, as they understand the game their own way, as they see these numbers get introduced, I think they will get there. I've never felt guilty about using analytics the right way. Mm -hmm. I have felt guilty when I see things kind of getting misplayed or twisted. Right. That's, that's what you don't like because, okay, that's someone who either doesn't understand it or they are, they're lying with statistics and Is that a big issue for us at ESPN that you, that you notice? Uh, that I, a lot of it's misrepresented? I, I think there is, some of it is, there are times where I, we feel like you've done a segment that uh, I don't know if we wanted to go there. I think, did we do a, se we did a segment on Alex Smith or something right before he got hurt and how high his QBR was? Yeah, that was a, yeah. I, I think it played yeah. it up a little bit more than I would have <laughs> What's liked. the truth? You know, as a matter of fact, I, I remember, I think, Alok, you, you put me in check on something. This is when I was, because one of the things you were kind enough to do when we first started Numbers Never Lie, we had like almost an impromptu, you know, class on a lot of the advanced <laughs> analytics. And I think one time I tried to, don't laugh at me, for those of you who know this, I think once I tried to add two players, player efficiency rating, right. and you were like, Dean is gonna kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were like, don't, yeah. ever, don't, like, don't ever do that again. I'm like, I don't understand. Why can't I just add these two guys together? And <laughs> right. like, no, do not do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that, that's like a math error. I, I don't actually consider that that bad, uh, you know, because you wouldn't know, and then I told you, and then you knew. Right. It's more of the twisting of the numbers that I find, like, that we talked about. So, like, you have to, there's a lot of language, like Dean says, around, like, just because the guy has the highest QBR, like, that doesn't mean he's going to be the best quarterback. So, like, that, what is it measuring and what is it not measuring, I guess, is where we kind of have to do it. And, and, you know, there has to be receptiveness to analysts to understand that, like, you know, one college football power index will say Notre Dame is the best resume, and mm -hmm. the other one will say Alabama is the best team tomorrow on the field. So there's language there, but we have to overcome that by talking to them. Halak and I have talked about what exactly is sports analytics, and it, it was a useful conversation. We talk about it is kind of, it's a process. It's not, it's not just QBR. QBR is, yeah. is a result of the analytics process, and it's a process of getting at the truth of, of sports and winning 
kind of using numbers in that process. There is a thought process that is very subjective, but then it, we use the numbers to try to get at what is objective, and, and that is what we're really trying to do. I, I really liked what Tom Tango did with, uh, what, um, with when probably added, because Tom Tango, for those who know, is a sabermetrics like God. Um, and I remember when he, he described as win percentage is really just fan emotion. So when you look at a graph of win percentage, he just said that is your emotions quantified. And you're feeling really good up here when you're 90%, and then it drops, plummets down to like 5%. And you can actually see your, your heart sink. <laughs> And, he, and that was really telling to me was a lot of these analytics that we do is really just tying our emotions mm -hmm. to what we're watching and, and quantifying that. Right. So that's what I try to do a lot is try to relate it to emotions or visually because we're not pulling these numbers out of thin air. We're actually taking them from the game. So right. it's something to keep in mind is that a lot of these things that we're quantifying is stuff that already happens. We just have never looked at it in that way. I got the signal for five minutes left. This is flown by for me. I hope it's flying by for you guys as well. Do you guys have any final thoughts? I might open it up to anybody who wants to step to the mic with some questions uh, for a couple of minutes. You guys have any final thoughts y'all want to share? Anybody want to come up, questions, yeah. up uh, and ask a question at the microphone that I may not have gotten to? I apologize if I didn't get to everybody's. Uh, I got a question. My mic on. Right. There you go. Hey, you know, <laughs> speaking of the devil. Hey, you know, hey man, the dude beside you, might better watch your mouth talking about the athletes. And <laughs> so, Michael, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm <laughs> just playing. That's just. I, I, I so, my, this question for Michael Smith. Uh oh. How do you how do you keep the analytics and, and the questions that you're asking, you know, all these numbers and everything? How do you keep it entertaining while you're doing your show? Well, thankfully, I have you, Hugh. You damn right. <laughs> 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 say, say it again. I have, I have, I have you beside me. To keep it entertaining, I think I, I I know how to keep it in context. I think and to understand that it's a it's a piece. It's not the end all be all. I think as much work as you guys put into it, you all realize mm -hmm. it's not the end all be all for sports Absolutely. conversation or sports information. So at the end of it all, we're all fans. I just want to be more informed. I just want to be educated. I still have my opinions. I can still be as entertaining as I can possibly be. But I try to just incorporate the analytics, incorporate the, the statistics into my presentation as best as possible. Same thing, you're, I mean, we're not, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel here, just trying to make people smarter. I mean, I, I, was, I wrote something the other day about Doug Collins loves statistics, but when you bring up analytics, he just, like, freaks out. Wait, how does that work? I, well, he loves, like, points, points per in the game paint. and the regular yeah. basic statistics. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he loves citing numbers, but <laughs> this is, no, but this goes back to what he was talking about. Everyone talks about numbers, right. but when you tag like sabermetrics to it or analytics or advanced stats, people kind of right. freak out. But really, numbers are a part of our conversation already. Right. We're just trying to elevate that conversation and throw a new um, analytics way to have look. changed the relationship of points to winning. Right? Right. For a long time, Doug would cite points as as a correlation with winning, and what we and analytics finds that well, you know, it may not correlate as much, and that's the part that gets a little bit uncomfortable for some people. And analytics can still be most, Hugh, as you know, analytics can still be, or statistics can still have a, a emotion and a personality to them. Right. You know, there's still oh, people delivering them. You know absolutely. what I mean? At least for our purposes in terms of storytelling, you can yeah. still use them to tell the kind of story that you want to tell. Yes, sir? As more and more data gets collected and analytics continue to become more complicated, how do you continue, I guess, to keep that accessible for people? How do we keep the data accessible? How do we keep the analytics accessible? As a writer, I'm more talking along lines. Oh, as, as to, to make it accessible to a broad group of people? Uh, I think it is, it does come down to really telling that story, understanding the question. You, you mentioned the question. What is the question at the start? And that question will open up different avenues. And a lot of times they've been subjective as that data allows you to talk about those things. We, we're not sure how we're going to do like the optical data to tell a lot of those stories yet. We're learning that. But a lot of them are pretty obvious. You talked about the time in the pocket stuff and, and how it may free up the wide receivers. Just making that link is making things a little more accessible, I think. Yeah, SportView, uh, Sport View, 3D tracking cameras mm -hmm. in the NBA, um, a lot of the stuff that they're tracking are stuff that we've always wanted them to track. And it's really easy language how many touches does Dwight Howard get in the post? 
Like you have to manually do that, and people, have, coaching staffs have done that for years. Um, so while the data is getting a lot more, I don't know, robust, I don't really think that a lot of it needs to be so complicated. So touches, dribbles, passes, stuff in the NBA we've always wanted to track, we're gonna be able to have that conversation now. Um, so it's not necessarily comp more complicated. A lot of the stuff is actually being more simplified. And it kind of um, starts on the other side from the person watching the game has the question. Then you go to see what we've got about it. You're not necessarily, we do have a ton of stuff that, but, and it is fun to look through and try to get ideas from it, but a lot of times it starts with, okay, what am I curious about? Or what did I read that really annoys me? You know, that, that <laughs> seemed like, this doesn't seem right. And so, um, you know, and then you, you weave in your own anecdotal stuff. You have to go talk to a coach. I mean, they, they love, depending on how old the coach is a lot of times, but they, they love to hear some of this stuff and scouts love it. I find there's kind of a divide between, you know, I think a lot of front office people love this stuff and um, some coaches do, but not all. But it's just going to change. It'll, it'll change and be more embraced. And, and this is going to help us uh, learn more about the game because we will be able to get some answers to questions that we wouldn't even thought of the question. Absolutely. Yeah, no, the more, um, the more front offices and, and organizations embrace it from their side, the more we continue to embrace it on the air, you know, the more educated the fan will be. They're and gonna when you do introduce yeah. it into our language, frankly, because you're gonna interview them and they're gonna talk about it. When mm -hmm. Calipari talked about BPI. Right? Okay. Yep, and, and it has, you know, if you look at the leaders in QBR, for example, they're all, it's not like it's trying to tell us that, that <laughs> Kevin Cobb had the best season in the league last year. I mean, it lines up usually right. with, and when it doesn't, that's when you get past the really great questions. Ha, God, what, that's odd. I thought he was, that, that's what we wanna be. That we, we, it's like it's tipping you off to something to look into. Cool. Well, uh, that's all the time we have. If uh, we, we'll be obviously accessible um, at, after this and throughout the uh, throughout the rest of the conference. But we really appreciate you guys uh, coming in and supporting our efforts to uh, tell stories uh, through analytics. So that's going to do it for us. Thank you, guys. Thank you.